Well, the Discover Historic New England series continues at the Thomas Crane Public Library this month with a presentation called Shipwrecks of Cape Cod with Don Wilding, who's here right now to give us a little preview and tell us about himself and about this particular program. Don, great to meet you. Thanks for coming over. Hey, great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it very much. Tell us a bit about uh, yourself, if you could, first of all, your, uh, your, your background, your history, your, your writing expertise, your interest in this particular topic. Yeah, well, I've, I've become sort of a Cape Cod historian over the last... Oh, 10 or 15 years. But I, my background goes into newspapers for many years, oh, 30 years. Really? And I still write a history column for the Cape Codder newspaper in Orleans. But uh, first I was getting into the whole thing with Henry Beston, Quincy native, uh, and the outermost house. And that kind of led me down some other roads as well, uh, whether it was shipwrecks, uh, in this case, or Rum Runners <laughs> uh, of Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done some programs on the blizzard of 78. Okay. I've also written another book about, uh, it's called The Brief History of East Ham. Oh, okay. Uh, so it all kind of ties in with Beston. Yeah. But in this case, with the shipwrecks, he witnessed so many of those shipwrecks. Uh, and it kind of was natural because Cape Cod, the outer beach, is known as the graveyard of ships. Mm hmm Prior to the Cape Cod Canal being established, there were so many shipwrecks there between 1626 and, oh, the middle of the 20th century. You had anywhere between 3,000 to 4,000 shipwrecks really? out there. Wow. So it, it, was, it got so bad out there. That's why they started bringing in the Coast Guard and the Life Saving Service and all that. And it was, it was really a bad scene, mm -hmm. but it, until they could built the canal and technology improved too that's when a lot of it started to improve okay so, but there's so many so many great stories and just the shipwrecks that happened on the outer bar which is uh, it's phenomenal are you from the cape or? i'm originally from northern new jersey oh okay but uh i've lived <laughs> a different up, cape <laughs> yeah, yeah so well even that's that's far from where i was i was oh. closer to new york city oh, okay but um i've been up here my entire adult life i see so uh i've I've worked in mostly in journalism all those years, and things kind of changed over the last several years, mm -hmm. and now I find myself doing more of this kind of thing. Interesting. Uh, whether, it's, whether it's writing, whether it's lecturing, uh, that's pretty much what I've been doing. Okay, and why shipwrecks? You know, what was it about them that, that drew you to that? Well, it's, it, with shipwrecks, and, and I think it was best uh, how we described it with Henry Beston, uh, it was the courage and the mm. bravery that was involved with uh, having to go and rescue men who were stuck on these ships that ran aground. Because back in those days, you had to go around the outer cave. Mm -hmm. You had no canal to go through. So with the shipwrecks, it was just they would hit a bar during a storm usually. Sure. And these men were in great distress. Their ships were often getting pounded by waves. They were breaking up. And if the Coast Guard or the Life Saving Service could get there in time and save these men, it required great heroics, mm. whether it was using a breeches buoy, mm -hmm. a zip line kind of uh, thing, or using uh, a lifeboat going through these waves that are 10 feet high. Yes. You know, yeah. it, it, was, it was really, really, uh, it was bravery, but they were, they were doing this to save lives. And that was the uh, that was just such a great appeal about it. I thought. So that's is it is it more than the heroics involved with the rescue, or is it the actual wrecks themselves and and the crew members and, and the circumstances that led to that 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 interests you? It's a little bit bit of both. Bit of both. Okay. I mean, there's great stories in so many of these shipwrecks. Sure. Yeah. Uh, when you get into them, uh, whether it's the wreck of the Castagna in 1914, off the coast of Wellfleet, mm. uh, even the Somerset in off of Provincetown mm -hmm. uh, during the American Revolution. There's so many different great stories behind all these. The presentation itself here at the library, what will this involve? What does it entail? Well, I tend to focus more uh, on, uh, on what happened bringing about the Life Saving Service, okay. and, but also the wrecks that were mostly happening from the dawn of the Life Saving Service. That was about 1872 okay. until about the 1930s or so. And I tend to steer away from the Witta 
and uh, the Pendleton, which is featured in the Finest Hours yes. uh, movie, yep. because both stories, they've been done. Everybody knows about Everybody them. Everybody knows yeah. about them. Yeah. I don't want to have to repeat what's already been okay. done and done very well. Okay. Uh, I, I tend to focus more on some of these stories that maybe people don't know about. Uh, stories like the Montclair, uh, the shipwreck that happened off of Orleans in 1927 mm. and got featured uh, quite a bit when its timbers were exposed mm -hmm. last year. And uh, it was all over the place and uh, in, in the media and the newspapers. The Boston Globe called me up about it. Okay. And uh, it was, that, that too was a great story. Yep. Uh, so there was so much, there's just so many great human element stories in these uh, shipwrecks mm -hmm. as well. So th there's a lot of stories to tell. Are and, there any? Sometimes I don't even get to them all. Is that right? <laughs> Are there any, you know, relatives of folks that were lost in some of these wrecks still around today that, that you're aware of? Uh, I, I, not so much the wrecks. I've because they came. A lot of times the wrecks, the people came from places that are far off. I see. Sometimes even foreign countries. I see. Okay. So, but I have come across a lot of people who uh, are descendants of Coast Guard. Mm officers, yep. surfmen, as they called them back oh, in those days. Okay. And uh, you run into some of these folks, and they can tell you stories. They, they've given me photographs yep. of, uh, that you might not otherwise find. So it's, it's really great to see what these people were like and, and how they lived. And it, it's not like this was a, a lucrative job mm. either. They, they were paid maybe... Sixty dollars a month hmm. back in the say the nineteen twenties, yep. uh, which is you know around the time of the First World War is when a, a lot of this was going on, and even before mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they weren't getting paid great, but you could live on it on Cape Cod. Yeah, you know there yeah. weren't a lot of other options uh, other than fishing and maybe farming. And then later on, rum running. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, it, it's the predecessor to the U.S. Coast Guard, right? Is That's right. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. Life Saving Service was established in, in uh, 1872. Okay. And they hired a, a gentleman named Sumner Kimball, who became the first superintendent of the Life Saving Service. It was actually part of the Treasury Department. Mm. Mm. And the Life Saving Service operated that way uh, until 1915 when it became part of the Coast Guard. Yeah, the revenueers, right, they called them? Yeah, revenue cutters. Yeah. And that was another part of it. Right. But the Life Saving Service was established because there was a need for people to be, there were so many shipwrecks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The only way that they could take care of that prior to the Life Saving Service was through the Mass Humane Society, hmm. believe it or not. Yeah, that's and, interesting, yeah. And they, they would build these little huts along the outer beach where shipwreck victims could go into. Okay. But they were also kind of like, they were volunteers. Yes, yeah. And, but you get what you pay for. You know, you can only get so many volunteers to help out with a shipwreck. Right. And it got to be too much to handle. Yeah. That's when they brought the government in and the Life Saving Service. And Sumner Kimball was very good at going to Congress and getting money uh, appropriated for, uh, for that sort of thing. Sure. So I guess, Don, what would you like folks to kind of take away from your, your presentation here in Quincy? You know, what, what's the overall general message that you're trying to evoke? Uh, just, it's, an, it's another great story that maybe they don't know about, okay. of bravery and, uh, you know, heroics. Mm -hmm. uh, and these guys were just, they were doing their job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the way a lot of them looked at it. So it's, it's, a, f it's a chapter of, uh, of service, maybe, that isn't, quite remembered okay uh, and and especially if you go to the outer cape and there's just so much history out there mm -hmm. you could go to all these different places like a lot of people don't know if they go to the beachcomber and wellfleet that it was a uh you know it's a nightclub now right but back in the day it was the cohen hollow life-saving service okay. station and then again uh and then with the coast guard mm -hmm. and that operated until the 1940s okay. when they shut it down but a lot of people don't know that. Right. They see the Coast Guard station at Coast Guard Beach in East Ham. Right. They might not know what the history is behind it, but there's a lot of history behind that. Okay. 
Uh, it's so more than just a vacation destination in the summertime. Oh, there's right? so much history there. Yeah. And it's just, it's buried in the sand. <laughs> Quite <laughs> literally. Literally, yeah. yes, that's right. Are there any wrecks that do you think have not yet been exposed or uncovered? Oh, I'm sure there are. Really? Uh, I can't imagine that there aren't. Uh, yeah. There's just, every now and then, timbers will be exposed from the dunes after a bad storm. Right. And maybe they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it could be, it could have been uh, old structures, or it may have been a shipwreck mm. uh, that just got buried there. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they've had timbers exposed out on Herring Cove in Provincetown, and it takes a long time for some of the people to figure out what it actually is or might be. Not Sometimes just it's just wood, an right? intelligent guess. Yeah. Uh, you can go out there and you can get maritime historians who go out there and they see what kind of nails were used okay. or whatever. And they can kind of figure out what era it was from. And and maybe they can make a guess by going back on the old life-saving service records yes. and seeing what happened there so many years ago. And, and they can kind of figure out, oh, it was this era and it, shipwrecks happened here at this such and such a date mm -hmm. so maybe they can piece it together but okay. that's kind of what it is it's solving an old puzzle okay interesting <laughs> very good well we look forward to your presentation anything else you'd like to tell folks about it uh just that you're look to learn something that maybe you haven't heard before yeah well i mean quincy is of course certainly a seafaring community that's itself certainly you know, right long and, maritime history and henry beston was one of those people yeah and he and he came to absorb all the history of the outer cape as well so great well, thanks again for stopping by and uh, have a great presentation. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. If you'd like to learn more about this or any of the programs at the library, check out their website, thomascranelibrary.org.